Hi, may I speak with Dr. Bruns, please? Yeah, hi. Hey, how are you? This is Will Manzano. Yeah, hi. How are you? I was just typing an email to you. I just saw your response. Uh, okay. How are you today? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Good. Are you still okay to do this right now? Yeah. Um, let me just say, I looked over the. I just read the, the questions that you sent. And what I was um, just typing to you was that, gee, I, I don't have information or, or any expertise that's relevant to most of those questions. What the work that we did? I don't. Have you seen any of the work that was published? As we got deeper into the topic, we wanted to explore different uses for PEG 3350. We reached out to Dr. David Bruns. He's a retired pathologist from the University of Virginia. He co-authored a paper about a burn cream containing PEG. All three of the subjects died from ethylene glycol poisoning. I mean, the work that we did was to characterize a fatal syndrome in adult humans that was associated with exposure to PEG. And, and specifically, the exposure was through a burn cream that was that had antimicrobials in it that was used on patients with massive burns. And what happened in that situation was that with the skin barrier broken down, the PEG was, was absorbed right into the body and it led to fatalities. And we characterized that pretty carefully, both uh, the human exposures that we had data, that we had samples from, uh, including autopsy tissue, and also in rabbits, where we reproduced all of the findings just with PEG. And then in the course of doing that, part of the characterization that we undertook uh, was also to study how PEG is metabolized in the body, both in rabbits and in humans. For somebody like me who really doesn't understand much of how this stuff works, my only experience is myself with my child who went through this same thing about four years ago um, as far as having side effects from uh, taking Miralax, uh, which is the reason for why I pursued uh, doing this whole uh, podcast thing. Um, my, my question to you is to try to more to understand how, uh, how PG affects uh, the body. So in, in the cases that you saw where it got absorbed through the skin, uh, I guess where the tissue wasn't there, um, how does it, how does it affect the body? Like, can you kind of explain a little more? Well, the predominant things that we saw were, uh, related to kidney damage. All of the patients wound up in with severe real, uh, impairment. And, uh, the, the other, when the polyethylene glycol is metabolized, it, on the on the way to being turned into an acid, it it, it, it uh, is metabolized to an aldehyde, and the aldehydes are, we think, part of the reason for the kidney failure, because they're very reactive and they just re aldehydes react with everything. And uh, so, whenever you get PEG in the body, we we think that uh, you know you're going to see this metabolism to the to the toxic aldehydes and to the acids and with the calcium being high, uh, bound up <clears throat> that leads the body to try to uh, adjust to adjust the calcium try to try to get more calcium and so it turns on hormones that uh, release calcium from the bones short periods of time the bones are, can survive with can do you know can, can get along there's a lot of hell of a lot of calcium in bones obviously so we and, don't really know what the effect would be long term on you know chronic exposure. And about how many patients died from from that using that medicine? Uh, there were about ten, I think. All within a short span I, of time, or this is through a couple yeah. of years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, once we discovered what was going on, once I got involved, I figured out what was going on fairly quickly, and they stopped using the burn creams. And the FDA sent out a letter that says, don't use this burnt cream because there's polyethylene glycol is a problem. <laughs> now, they, they, the, the, that product, by the way, is a, a sidelight. The product is still on the market. And uh, I think that in small burns, like if you burn your finger, you put some on, it's not going to kill you. Yeah, you're going to be all right. But uh, I do worry that uh, one of these days we're going to see an outbreak again of... of uh, of this problem and, and what it's 
And what is PEG's role in, for example, in a burn cream? What is what does it actually do? Well, it's actually interesting. Uh, the big, big problem with big uh, major burns is infection because you've lost that barrier. And so the burn cream carries antimicrobials uh, to try to kill off the bacteria that we're trying that are trying to proliferate there. And the polyethylene glycol is actually uh, the specific one they were using is really very good. It, it, it can dissolve the antibiotic in it, and the, the, the mixture, the cream, then penetrates deep into the burn wound, which is where you want the antibiotics to be. Is there any? Th- so you know, my focus mainly here has been like parents and and you know who have gone through these issues with their kids. Um, <laughs> Is there anything else you see that's that's parallel between what you saw with the burn cream and uh, some of the stuff that I asked you? Yeah, I, the thing that uh, I, I've thought about this actually before I knew anything about the problems your parents are facing, uh, that polyethylene glycol in the Miralax, I'm sure that some of that is absorbed uh, through the intestine just as polyethylene glycol was absorbed uh, through the skin because the skin barrier was compromised. So the parallel <clears throat> that I think about is that if the intestinal barrier to absorption of things that you don't want to absorb is in any way compromised, the polyethylene glycol is going to be absorbed. And in fact, as I recall, <clears throat> PEG absorption was used as a test of the integrity of the intestinal barrier. I think it might still be used, I don't know. But it, it's, a, it's a very convenient thing because you can get any molecular weight, any size of polyethylene glycol you might like. And I think the kind that's in Miralax, I think it's a mixture of it's a two different polyethylene glycol cuts in the, in the Miralax, I don't remember. Anyway, my guess is that that stuff is absorbed <clears throat> and, and it's gonna vary from one person to the next. Uh, some people will absorb a lot of it. Some people will absorb a And so, I don't know. Have you encountered that that issue? Well, so in in what way would like the intestine tract be compromised? What would be examples of that? Uh, there are all kinds of intestinal conditions that'll do it, uh, and some of them I suspect I suspect there are things that we don't even know about that would do it. Uh, like and I haven't. Do you have read any, that literature in recent years. Have you looked at it at all at, at absorption of polyethylene glycol? We've looked at a lot of that stuff. You know, I guess uh, a lot of these cases just come from from children who have been suffering with uh, constipation. Like that's obviously the the general, uh, you know, the the yeah. the common part of it. Um, it yeah. seems like I, everybody has different different backgrounds and different conditions leading up to this. So you know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly the, you know what's what's common between all the different cases. Um, yeah. So I guess, I guess my question was going to be like, you know, a kid who's severely backed up or something or chronic constipation would that would having an issue like that compromise the intestines a little bit? It wouldn't surprise me. I, I'm not a gastroenterologist, but as a pathologist, I, just the way I think, it seems like it would be a, a, a set up for potential problems. The mucosal barrier is, is uh, in the intestine is, is uh, complex, and there are all kinds of things that can mess up the uh, mess that up. I don't know. Maybe just straining a stool could do it. I don't know. How's your, your son? My son, yeah, he's he's good. I mean, you know, he's he's nine now. He he took this about four years ago, four to five years ago, and um, he had a lot of different side effects from it. Um, you know, and like I mentioned, anxiety and paranoia, not so much aggression. Um, once we took him off, it went away completely. We went back on it maybe a year later, and immediately started seeing the same side effects. So that's when we knew we were kind of right with our gut with that. So we stopped it, uh, and ever since then he's been good. He still has some lingering kind of similar anxieties here and there, and who knows if that's just who he is or if that's still a result from it. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to understand more about as we do these interviews. So, you know, I, my case was so so small compared to all the other ones that we've been encountering that you know I feel kind of on the lucky side of things. So, I see. what are the main main 
findings of, that, I mean, the main symptoms that kids are having? Um, a lot of the, the, the main issues are anxiety, paranoia, and aggression. So it's a very common thread between all these cases that I'm seeing. And it's definitely kids become who parents don't recognize. Kids become aggressive. Kids become paranoid. They start seeing or seeing or feeling like they're, you know, things are going to happen. Uh, like my son, for example, felt like somebody was going to break into the house. And, you know, it, all of a sudden it was very vivid and came out of nowhere, really. And I've already heard this like three or four times in the last couple of days from other parents. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Do the doctors that you talk to, do they have another explanation for why this should be happening? Do they think it's because of whatever it was that led to taking the Marillax and maybe that's the cause? Based on the parents' uh-huh. um, explanation of what doctors told them throughout, um, they blame a lot on kids who are constipated, tend to have all these other issues and the, the gut biome and, uh, you know, all these other th- it, it, it almost becomes blamed on like the type of kid who gets constipated is like this and you know so has any doctor or anybody told parents that it could be you know something else sure i think that's the that's the common thread it's not it's not really blaming it on the marilex so yeah i see yeah i get it i get it okay okay i'm glad to hear your son is doing better i I, think what you're doing is uh you know it's really commendable i applaud you for doing taking the initiative taking on the work that it obviously isn't involved for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's our pleasure. Right. We hopefully uh, right. hopefully we can get it out there. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. And you too. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Dr. Bruns gave us tremendous insight, and we feel like we're beginning to understand polyethylene like 3350 a little bit better. Join us next time. We'll be speaking to Mike Kohler about his personal story and how the popular Facebook group Parents Against Marilyn has been key in connecting and helping parents all over the globe. Thanks for listening. This episode was edited by Dan McLennan and myself, Wilfredo Manzano. If you like what you've been hearing, please remember to share, rate, and review.